the tech. We're through to the tech, guys. Sell side, 55s. Bottom edge, 94s. A profit from a classroom we did yesterday of a very reasonable $3,000 per contract, guys. A profit of $3,000 per contract. You can't really disagree with that, can you, as, as a trade? You can't really argue with the fact that this is exactly what we did in classroom yesterday. What we can discuss is why you never got it. What we can discuss is why you didn't implement the classroom that we gave you from yesterday. Either you disagreed with it as a storyline, or you simply just refused to do it, or you simply failed to do it. If you fail to implement the volatility expansion which was at the core of yesterday's classroom the question of course then becomes why did you fail to implement it we've got to try and you've got to try and get to the bottom of that question why did you fail to implement the storyline we had a great first target narrative here and we had a great second target narrative here that is seriously good for anybody that simply just implements a strategy and gets on with it. Beautiful. Well done, guys. I like it. I like it. I like it a lot. Talking of things I like a lot, we made landfall at the bottom edge of the. B -b 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 -b. Oh, yes, we did. You can see it for yourself here. We got all the way to bottom print price for an enormous near $2,000 sell off again based on the dollar valuations. Now, when you hit that price, of course, the dollar's already started to regain um, a little bit of an offer there. So obviously, at that stage, your bond is probably time to come off. Now, remember, we want to be short bonds. It's concession time, guys. And yet, we had a chance to get short bonds into the 156.16's top line. This is a wholesale price up here. We've got to take these, right? This is concession week. This is concession week. You get it? So when I see that top line, which has been in play all the way through the US close, there's the US close right there, see it, 1950s. So when we throw that onto the charts there, you simply recognize the quality of this 156 and a half as a sell zone area. And who didn't know that? Well, if you didn't know that, guy, you shouldn't be trading bonds or anything else for that matter. You need to know this stuff. It's the basics, right? You must know that this was the bottom edge here. You must know these things. It's not nice to know. It's bloody well essential to know this stuff, right? And all we've done is sell the highs and buy the lows, guys. That's effectively, in a nutshell, what the bond is consisted of is selling the lows, which we can draw a straight line against, uh, selling the, buying the lows and selling the highs. It's as simple as that, guys. And it, yet it's been worth two grand on the way up and nearly two grand on the way down as well. It's nearly $4,000 round, round trip on bonds per contract. Some of the guys in here are trading five lots. That could have been a 20 grand day right there in one day. 20 grand. It's not a bad outcome, is it? Not a bad outcome, guys, is it? You've got to make it happen, guys. You've got to make it happen. It's that easy. Day high, day low, swing high, swing low, value lines. The story of the RGL on the um, the story of the RGL on the uh, on the S and P. Two grand from that as well. Crazy. My buy on gold that was live called. How much did that finally make? Well, there it is there. The buy on gold that we shouted in the room, 1831s, had a high price of 1852s. That was 2,100. So two grand on the S&P, four grand on bonds, two grand on gold. On a single contract, four, five, six, seven, eight thousand dollars on a one lot across three markets, eight grand. 
one single contract, three markets. So where's all your trades? Are they all dotted around all the rubbishy areas? Or are they in the good areas? Have a think about it. Where are your trades located? Are you getting the best of prices? Are you getting the best of deals? Are you seeing the same trades? Are you seeing that when there's no value, I'm simply not dealing? I'm simply not dealing when there's no value. So when we think about that, we obviously understand why we have periods of activity where obviously we get really busy and then we have periods where I end up just doing classes because there's not very much happening and you shouldn't be in a trade because there's no value to be in a trade at that stage. So we've got to try and uh, we've got to try and uh, monetize the stuff that you know about here, guys. Uh, David concession the 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 market the bond market trades in a concession um, into the beginning of every month, assuming we have a big auction during the uh, during the, the the beginning of the the second week, basically. So when we come into the auction, the auction phases on the tens and the thirties. Um, are always in the second week of the month, which means that when we come into the new contract role or the beginning of a month after the rebalancing that's taken place, the bond price for the direct dealers, bearing in mind the direct dealers will pick up billions of dollars of real money bonds when they come into the uh, auctions. They will pick up billions of dollars. They always pick up billions of dollars. So we're talking about Goldman Sachs. We're talking about Bank of America. We're talking about HSBC. We're talking about all the biggest banks in the world will pick up billions of dollars of real money bonds. And they want the best price for those bonds because they're stuck with them, right? They're stuck with them. And how do you get the best price? You drive the bond down and down and down and down to as low as a price as you possibly can for the auction. Because now you're going to buy the bonds fixed. You're going to buy the bonds at that fixed price. And obviously, it's up to you to get the best possible price. Now, obviously, when you're in an interest rate hiking cycle, which is what we're in here, the one thing I don't want to do is buy billions of dollars worth of bonds and not have a massive discount in price because we're going to give away interest rates over the course of the next few months, right? We're going to have that 50 interest rate cycle hitting again this week, uh, this month. And then we've got another 50 interest rate hike hitting again next month. Well, obviously, if I get a terrible price from a bond, my bond is going to lose massive amounts of money if I end up paying over the odds for that bond, right? Massive amounts of money. I'm going to lose up billions, potentially lose billions of dollars over that few month period. So the way I guarantee that I'm not going to lose billions is you go into the concession process. The concession doesn't happen every month. It's only when the rate hiking cycle comes into play that it really starts giving us a concession. Because obviously, if we've got a rate dropping cycle, then of course, we don't want to drive the bond price down. We would rather have the price as high as possible. Uh, you know, when you think about those kind of ideas, because obviously, the idea of interest rates dropping is going to drive bonds up. So we don't really have to try and get the bond down in price during that period. So we have to be aware of where we are in the, cycle, the, the uh, interest rate cycle. But at the moment, we're inside a rate hiking cycle. And as a result of being inside the rate hiking cycle, we've got to get concessions. So as a rule, at the beginning of the first week in every month, the one thing we never do, never do, is buy at higher prices. We still buy at lower prices, but we never buy at higher prices. We never buy breakout highs. We never buy into top edges. We simply let everybody else do it, and then we sell to them at the best possible price. That is the concession process that we must, must, must try and stick with. Are there exceptions? On occasions, yes. Delta hedging, for example, could put a, could put a big buyer in bonds, and we don't want to be selling to those guys, for example. The bond may go a lot higher than you first thought. We could have a big drop off in inflation, which might mean that the demand for bonds at a certain price is actually improving a little bit. So we don't need as big a concession. But if inflation's rising and we're in a rate hike cycle, the one thing you can absolutely guarantee is that we must sell bonds at top edges. We must, must, must sell bonds at top edges. And obviously, getting into that bond at the top edge is an absolute, uh, an absolute given, because I will always be selling bonds at top edges during the, uh, during the concession cycle. 
And that's what we've seen today. We've seen that massive bond short. I mean, look at the buy deltas. There wasn't any, was there? Nobody was stupid enough to buy bonds at those higher prices. Look at the delta, guys. Now, the delta on bonds is a little bit unusual to try and work with because it's a, because it's a bond. Most of the trades are curve trades. But you see what happens up here. If you look at this top edge up here and you look at the, uh, if you look at some of these uh, cycle highs and lows, you can see some of these key areas that you've obviously got on the charts. There was a big, uh, big block sell here. You can see where some of these key areas are if simply by drawing the level on our screens here. And uh, you can already start to recognize the fact that as we came up into the top edge, look, there is no delta buyer, is there? There's no buyer into that top edge, rightly so. It's just a great price to start selling into, right? It's just a great price. So selling into that, absolute delicious, absolutely delightful. And then what a popper, guys, what a popper. Crazy, isn't it? Absolutely crazy. Making that kind of money out of today's markets without, really without any difficulty at all, was it? Without any difficulty at all. Loved it. Loved it a lot today, guys. Loved it a lot today. We'll be touching again on the, the, the uh, we'll be touching again on the concept of exhaustion prints, that massive gold trade. Um, because that was a great example of what we were talking about this morning. That's why we got the massive gold trade on the books in the first place, was the very, very strong storyline against that exhaustion narrative. You can see we've got an exhaustion narrative on gold again here. You can see what's going on here. A lot of sellers. So with a lot of sellers in here, it'd be nice to try and find some sort of liquidity pop. And, and one would imagine that we could... Um, we could probably see some liquidity if we broke this level here into that little liquidity. There might be a few stops fall out of bed up here, but you know, again, it's um, there's just exhaustion prints here, so there's a great chance that they might try and run it back up through that during that exhaustion. So uh, we'll see how that exhaustion gets on in this current uh, gold climate here. I like the short trade. There's a good amount of value on the short side at the moment. Um, there wasn't a lot of value for the top edge. The yen had started to sell, so if you wanted to do anything at the top edge, you could have sold gold and bought the yen. Do you see how that works, guys? I keep on mentioning it. Maybe, maybe, maybe someday, someday we'll trade it. But you can see that we had a brilliant uh, value divergence here. So what that does is it takes away the fear of doing the bloody trade, right? So if I see the gold at a top edge, I may be concerned about gold selling because of something else. But if I see the gold at the top edge and I see the yen at the bottom edge, well, why don't I just do it as a spread? And then I can make up my mind which one I like. Yeah. So the gold sells, the Japanese yen rallies. What the hell is that all about? Well, it's a spread. That's why it happens, right? So when we get into this balance area here, I could now do one of two things. I could do nothing or I could close off both trades, actually I could do several different other things as well. I could close off both trades for a double alpha profit there, long yen made money, short gold made money. Or I could decide which one is correct in this balance area. Close off the one I think is wrong and get ready to deal. Or I could do one other thing. How else can you trade a spread, guys? How else could you trade a spread? Well, think about a spread narrative. If I've sold a high price and I've bought a low price and the low price has gone up and high price hasn't gone up, it's gone down, how could I now trade this on the basis that I simply don't know which one's right without losing the trade? If I simply don't know which one's right, how could I now trade this? How could, I, how could I now trade this, guys? Well, very simple. Very simple indeed, actually. I could put a buy stop at break even plus one here. And I could put a sell stop at break even plus one here. And obviously, whichever way the market goes, I get stopped at break even on one market and I make a breakout trade, hopefully, on the other market, right? So obviously, what happens is that if this market then drops down, I get scratched out at plus one, yeah? 
But if that market's dropping, my hope would be that this market would also start dropping, in which case I've offset the difference simply during that period. But now I've got a decision, not being made by value, but being made by market forces. I've got a decision about which one's right and which one's wrong at that stage. So obviously that's exactly what you can do in these types of situations, hence the reason why spread trades are so much more valuable. Number one, they got you into the trade. Number two, you then put your stops at break even on gold. You put your stops at break even on the yen. And obviously the yen got stopped out. The gold broke lower. Your yen is now break even at break even plus one. And you're now short gold. And your short gold went from a price of 52s to 40s for another $1,200 a profit. And what could you do just now? You can start buying some yen against the gold uptick. So when you saw the yen starting to catch a bid here, you would close out your gold. And there, of course, because the yen is now catching a bid, you could close out your gold in there. The yen is catching a bid from that point onwards into that level two. And obviously at that stage, you close out your, your, uh, your gold. The yen is the market that's discounted. So you start buying yen on down ticks. And because you're now no longer in an outright trade, you would then be able to start selling some gold on upticks. Why would you sell gold on upticks? Well, you sell gold on upticks because it's a halfback trade, of course. Uh, if anybody didn't know that, shame on you. But there it is. There's your halfback narrative right there. There's your sell on gold right there. There's your opportunity to get short gold. Who doesn't follow any of this, guys? Who's not doing this stuff? It's crazy. How easy it is. So there's your sell on gold. You could have bought the yen at the bottom edge, but obviously the idea is to be checking your uh, real value in terms of uh, real yields. So you want to get into the real yields to see if the yen is a buy at bottom edges. And you can see that with the real yields, very, very bearish gold, the real yields has gone bullish here. So this is a great opportunity to buy some, some Japanese yen at the bottom edge, right?